Wasatch Weekends for this Saturday, October 7th edition. I'm your host, Ben Roof. We've got a great show in store for you today with Nuzzles & Co. stopping by to tell us about their adoptable pet of the week. Bill Humbert's also got some wonderful career advice for us. We've got a local artist and then comedian Dan Donahue is also stopping by to tell us a little bit about what it takes to be a comedian on Instagram. But First, a quick local announcement. Today is the last day to attend the Park City Wine Festival, where you have the opportunity to try wines from the West Coast to France with 100 different wineries available at the Grand Tastings. Of course, you also have the opportunity to elevate your wine knowledge with classroom-style sessions hosted by famous winemakers and expert sommeliers. Don't forget to get your tickets at parkcitywinefest.com. And of course, there's also the Twilight Drive-In by Park City Film tonight, and that's going to be at the Snow Park Base Area, lot number four. If you're looking for tickets, head over to parkcityfilm.org. Now let's take a quick look at today's weather before we head outside. This weather report is brought to you by Sun and Ski Sports, your new mountain sports headquarters. Welcome back to Wasatch Weekends. Once again, it's Saturday, so we've got our friends from Nuzzles & Co. joining us to introduce us to one of their adorable, adoptable friends. Welcome to the show, McKenna. Hi, thank you so much for having us. It's always a pleasure. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you guys. And who do you have with you today? Today we have Miss Cessna. She's hiding a little bit now. <laughs> Maybe put you up on the couch so you can see her a little bit better. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but she is five months old puppy. She is such a sweetheart. She came here from Shiprock, New Mexico on a plane, which is why she's kind of named after a private plane. <laughs> and she is doing super, super well with her training, picking up on commands very easily. And it's just such a lover. Just loves everyone and kids and people and other dogs. She oh, definitely like seems like a super sweet and curious pooch. And I mean, for six months old, I can't believe you're getting her to stay so still on the couch. Yeah, she's really cr such a good pup for her age. You know, you'd expect her to be bouncing off the walls. And, you know, she has her waves of energy, but she's really just such a good pup. Um, and she should be so easy to get acclimated to any environment. <laughs> So what is a daily routine for a pup like Cessna out at the Nuzzles & Co. Ranch? What do you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis with all of your pups or your cats? So in the morning, she, of course, gets breakfast, which she loves. She loves meal time. She's a big treat and dinner person. Of course, she wants more of the treats in my pocket, so I'm going to give her one more. Um, and then after uh, she gets her... Her uh, breakfast, she has a little break time so her food can digest, and then she goes out into one of our big yards. So we have 100 acres of land on our rescue land, ranch, and in that 100, 100 acres of land, we have huge um, kennels that we have, or like yards, that we have fenced off so that the dogs can play around in these yards. Um, and we have uh, agility courses and benches for them to lay on and shade um, for them to go under if it's hot out. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of fun for them to get some outdoor time. And then as soon as she's done with her outdoor time, um, she gets to head over to our adoption center um, where she gets to meet lots of different people looking to adopt dogs. Um, so she'll be there from noon to 5 p.m. Oh my goodness, I think I found the spot. <laughs> <laughs> you sure did. She looks like she needs all of the loves you can give her. Such a cute pup. She reminds me a lot about my dog. 
similar, very similar coloring. My dog's got a big white spot in his chest too, just like she does, but otherwise looks very Labrador. <laughs> Do you oh, know yeah. anything about her breed? Um, yeah, so we really don't know much about her breed because she came from a rural um, place, um, just found out in the desert, basically. Um, so we're not really sure what her breed might be. She does kind of have that labby look, um, but all of the uh, puffs that she came with all look so different. Um, out there, it is possible that they do have multiple fathers um, to one mother dirt for one litter. Um, so. We presume that might have been the case with a couple of her siblings just because they looked so different. One of them had super squatty legs. Um, but she just uh, has the longer legs, um, still staying pretty small, even for five months old. So we don't reckon she'll be a huge dog. She'll probably stay about the medium size. Um, but she is just so obedient if you're looking for a loyal pup. She is 100% dog and very, very loyal. Well, and it seems like the Cessna is not going to turn into a Boeing when you're not paying attention either. <laughs> oh, no. She's just a like, lover. So you guys got an event coming on this morning and a couple of other events going on later in the month. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your Raise the Wolf that's going on right now at daybreak starting this morning? Yeah, so if you guys are looking for something to do with your pup this morning, you can head all over to Founders Park in South Jordan, um, where they are having like a little pup festival called Raise the Wolf. Um, there will be lots of vendors, um, doggy food trucks, human food trucks, um, and then as well as a bunch of dogs available for adoption. Cessna might be there. You can, might be able to meet Cessna. Um, but yeah, you can go ahead and check it out and uh, head on over and see all the doggies available for adoption, all the fun things that the vendors have over at Raise the Wolf. And then later this month, we have a brewery night fundraiser. Um, you can check out a bunch of the details out on our website where we have the tickets available for sale. Um, so that's gonna be a very fun night um, down in Immigration Brewery. Um, oh my goodness, you're being so silly right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's gonna be, we're gonna have a, some awesome music with the Hardman uh, brothers coming and playing some awesome jams. And then we're gonna have some really good food, gourmet pizza and a whole whole tray of lots of really yummy food. And then an open bar is included with your ticket as well. So it's gonna be a fun night. It's all for the puppies. You'll get to snuggle some puppies out on the patio that night as well. So definitely be sure to come on uh, our website and check out and see all the details for that because it's going to be a good event. Awesome. That's going to be at the Emigration Brewery Thursday the 26th? Yes. Awesome. Well, it sounds like it's going to be an awesome adventure, a great activity, and then if you're looking for something to do today, make sure to go and check out the Raise the Wolf out at Daybreak in Jordan. And of course, if you see Cessna, make sure to give her a bunch of ear scratches. I'm sure she would love that. McKenna, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else you want to mention before we let you go? You know, uh, just come on by and see all of our adorable puppies and kitties available for adoption. They're and, so cute, and we have lots of them. <laughs> and make sure if you do, take, home with one, take one home with you if you can. Awesome. McKenna from Nuzzles & Co., thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to the show. The recruiter guy, Bill Humbert, is a frequent guest on our show, and he's always got some amazing advice on both searching for jobs or searching for employees. And he's joining us next to give us a little bit of tips on how to take advantage of some of the new technologies present in the job search. Let's take a look. Welcome back to the show. With AI becoming more and more prevalent in our workplaces, we've got Bill Humbert, the recruiter guy, joining us now to tell us a little bit about how AI can help us find the right employees or help us find the right job. Welcome to the show, Bill. Good morning, Ben. Thank you. It's so good to be back. Well, it's so good to have you on the show. And so as I was saying, AI is becoming a bigger part of all of our workplaces, and I'm sure it's impacting the job search too. So could you tell us a little bit about exactly how AI is really starting to be implemented into job searches? 
You know, I've I've been around for a while, and in 1981 to about 1995, I got my resumes through uh, U.S. Postal Service. And starting in 95, Monster began, the Online Career Center began, and technology started to enter. And the good news about that is it took away that, you know, immediately I could get a resume and we would be on our way. Now, AI is a different type of technology. It's artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, speaking back in the day, my dad used to tell me that I had artificial intelligence. But anyway, um, as a leading talent attraction consultant on both Google and Bing, my response to whether AI can improve your recruiting processes is a qualified yes. And it's based on the fact that technology can be used correctly or it can be used incorrectly. Which that totally makes sense. And it seems to me like there's a lot of different ways that an AI assistant can be implemented into the job search. And one of the ones that I'm most familiar with, and I think a lot of people are familiar with, is the keywords, like the keywords that are included in both the job postings and the AI going through all of the applicants looking for those same keywords. And keywording is something that you and I have talked about a little bit before, too. So why don't you refresh us a little bit on how that works within the job search process and then how AI kind of impacts it? Well, the way it works from the recruiting perspective and the way it's supposed to work is to go through, let's say, 100 people who applied for a position online and try to determine, using the keyword match, who might be the best qualified candidates. The only problem with that is, well, there's a couple problems. One is most job descriptions are poorly written, and therefore the keywords are probably the wrong ones. And then secondly, there are people, and I'm a career coach too, you know, I speak on both sides of this table. There are people like me who know what's going on, and then I coach my candidates to tailor the resume to the job description, and that enables them to get a higher score, which generally will mean somebody's going to give them a call. So that's the bad side of the keyword match is that they're, they're matching the wrong words because of a poorly written job description. Well, and I can definitely see how it would be difficult on behalf of the employer to really kind of narrow down exactly what the role is. Do you find that there is any way for AI to assist in coming up with a more accurate job description? You know, potentially it could be used that way. You list the responsibilities and identify whether they're daily responsibilities, weekly responsibilities, quarterly responsibilities, and annual responsibilities, and uh, enter all of that information into an AI uh, search. And um, the AI can maybe possibly come up with a better job description than the one the company has. And understand job descriptions are different than job postings. A job posting is marketing your position and it's not a, a job description. It just gives people a reason why they may want to explore further and find out what the job description really is. So help us out then with how AI tools can be implemented in a little bit more of a direct sense, the kind of aid in these, I don't know if miscommunication is necessarily the right word, but the mismatch between the job itself, the job description, and what the applicant has on their resume, or the, not job description, the job posting. Well, there's, you know, there's two different types of candidate. There are the hourly candidates like the uh, lifties at Altera and Vail. Then there's the professional candidates that are accountants, everybody that's in the professional side. And, and so the, the hourly workers are used to going to a website, completing an application and moving forward. 
AI can help you identify the best qualified professional workers more quickly than you can by getting on LinkedIn or than I can by getting on LinkedIn and searching through literally thousands of candidates. AI can do it like that. And that's what that's the benefit on the sourcing side to AI. So how exactly does that work? That AI is so able to quickly and identify or and easily identify a good potential candidate. Are they running off of that person's resume and social media platforms or does it go beyond that and do a little bit of its own research coming through the internet or something? You know, that goes everywhere. You know, the algorithm can search so much more quickly than a human can. And that's the reason uh, AI works more effectively because they can look at LinkedIn, social media, everywhere that that person has a presence and then come back to you with a list of people and a way to contact them. Uh, either through social media or, if you're <clears throat> really lucky, possibly even uh, give you direct contact information of that person. Awesome. And so it sounds like that's one really effective way to use AI to improve our search for potential candidates. But are there any ways that AI can help a candidate search for a potential job? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's just reverse, right? <laughs> uh, what companies in Salt Lake City are looking for financial analysts in the resort industry? And, uh, you know, and then that can pop up a list of companies that have posted positions out there, and it makes it much easier for somebody who's doing a job search to use AI, too. So do you typically go to like a service like ChatGPT to take advantage of the AI programs there? Or how do you implement AI in the job market? If you're doing it from a recruiting perspective, I suggest that you uh, look at companies like herohunt.ai because they're specifically focused on recruiting and, and generating candidates. And so, and there's a number of them. and and the best thing to do is do a free trial with each one and find which one works for you. From the candidate perspective, you can use chat GPT and that will work just fine. Awesome. Well, Bill, thank you so much for all of this fantastic information. Make sure that if you do need more information or if you have any questions for Bill Humbert, check out therecruiterguy.com. Bill, thank you so much for joining us and we'll be right back after a short break. This weather report is brought to you by Sun and Ski Sports, your new mountain sports headquarters. Welcome back to the show. We can all use a little bit of help getting back on track with both our health and our fitness goals, especially after the last couple of years. And Krista Car Caramillo is joining me now. She's the founder of Retrain, a fantastic app that's going to help us really get back on track. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the or, or how you started with Retrain and kind of what your goals are there? Sure. So I actually originally started Retrain after Hurricane Katrina. I'm from New Orleans originally. So after being displaced 
and moving back to New Orleans, Louisiana, I recognized the need for people to reset. So thus I started, I left the clinical space and went into uh, and started retrain. And moving forward, now 2023, relaunching into California with the pandemic happening, I'm seeing the need again. We're in a different world. We're in a different mindset. So really the idea here is a wellness and coaching company to really help people who have through this pandemic and through life in general with self-limiting behaviors. Um, so maybe self-sabotaging habits and stressors, really getting them clear and getting them back on a path to health through movement as medicine, uh, lifestyle change, uh, giving them the real facts about their health and what is happening, giving them that visual picture and giving them the tools and sort of toolbox to move forward with their health. So well, yeah. It seems like that's a really powerful tool, especially getting over some of those self-limiting beliefs and those hang-ups internally. I was watching this video recently of a dog that was jumping over baby gates. No matter how high the baby gate got, he could clear it easy. But then his parents put a vacuum in the way. Not a chance. The vacuum was right. smaller than all of the baby gates, but there was no way he was going to try and jump over that vacuum. And it was just an amazing little illustration there of how those self-limiting beliefs can impact us and how mental barriers can be a little bit more limiting than any physical barriers can be. So tell us a little bit about how Retrain helps to kind of surmount some of those internal self-limiting beliefs. I think the first step that we do mostly is, is and I'll track back a little bit, I think the opportunity for care and access to care is, is, is minimal right now. People are waiting and maybe they have to wait months to see a provider, a healthcare clinician. So I think the first step is really getting really honest about where you are and, and being really transparent and taking that perception that maybe we put out in the world and putting it and reflecting it on ourselves. And once we can get clear on that and why we wanna do something, it's a little bit easier to embrace habits. And the truth is we start with that, identifying and becoming real clear with where you are. <laughs> Cause if you don't know where you are, it's hard to move forward. And then taking them in tiny steps and using strategies such as movement, as medicine, um, becoming a little more reflective, finding out what makes the person tick, how they learn. And when you can tap into that through assessment, it's, it's a much easier, easier approach to kind of move them forward. But it really does start with self and then giving them those strategies and tools to move forward, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. When you're talking about movement as medicine, what exactly do you mean by that? Are we talking just yoga routines to kind of <laughs> help us stretch ourselves out or realign? Or are you talking more about how getting out there and some activity can really kind of help reset the brain chemistry a little bit? Yeah. Well, I use the term movement specifically because when people hear the term exercise, uh, not everyone's able to do that. And it can be very intimidating. And the truth is, I mean it in a kind of a holistic sense. We move the body. Right, we have 600 muscles almost in the body and we don't use half of them, if not a three fourths of them. So it's getting us off the couch. We spent a lot of time these last four years isolated. Um, so getting us moving physically, but also moving our minds. Um, finding things for input and output throughout the day, taking things in that are serving for us. In the morning when we wake, I always tell my clients, let's take something for input whether it's a podcast, whether it's an inspirational book or a meeting that you're hopping onto, and then use some time for output. So moving the mind, and then it goes a little bit deeper depending on where you're at. There's a spiritual component. Our bodies are energy, and I think it's really important to understand that. And the more that we can be in tune with ourselves, the more we can kind of move ourselves into a different direction that's more positive for, for us that makes sense. Uh, totally. And uh, I mean, definitely with that idea that just movement and engaging in movement. some sort of movement can also really help to kind of get your mind moving, to reuse yeah. the word, in a new direction and really kind of help jar us out of, you know, any habits or routines that might be creating some negative patterns with us. So, Going back to something you said earlier about having to be honest with ourselves, is that something yeah. that retrain really helps? I've found that it 
can sometimes take the input of another person to kind of help you be honest with yourself. How do you guys yeah. approach that? Well, I think when people come to me for work uh, in this space, often I've been working a lot with healthcare professionals. I'm a health healthcare professional, and there's been a lot of stressors that have had them turn to maybe poor behaviors, whether it be um, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, maybe self-medicating with substances. And, and the way we turn that around is really just getting them very, very clear and knowing it's a safe space, right? A lot of times when people come to us, they don't know where to start, or there's a little bit of shame threaded in there. Um, they don't want to talk about it. And that in and of itself is the first step, is just getting people to understand that you're in a safe space where people understand and resonate with where you are, and that there's a lot of people who are going through this. So I think when you can connect with a person and help them understand that, you know, this is, this is how sometimes we cope when we don't have the outlets that we maybe once had due to lots of things, maybe a pandemic, perhaps, maybe our job is, is taking over more time, or maybe we're just not making the time for ourselves. So it really does start with, I think, giving people a safe space to be heard and to tell their story. Well, and I mean, I can see that being super, super helpful. And it can definitely be challenging if you're trying to make some changes in your life to look at your life from that 30,000 foot angle and really kind of untangle the different knots and the different webs and to have that outside perspective, somebody else to take a look and be like, you know, maybe start over here can yeah. be super, super helpful. And it sounds to me like that's a lot of what Retrain is doing. It is. It is, a step, especially when it comes to the type of clients that I work with. And right now, a lot of it is healthcare professionals or athletes and people who might be in professions where and they're not able to hide. And what I mean by that is they have to work on a day to day basis with people. It's part of the profession, whereas maybe someone who can work from home can can be behind the computer screen. Um, there's nowhere sometimes for them to turn and to feel like, hey, sometimes the helper needs to help. <laughs> and there's the tricky part because we're supposed to be that that vision, that that place of authority that's helping and we can't be weak or vulnerable. And I, what I'm saying is the vulnerability is what's going to get you to the next step. You know, there's just growth and comfort can't live in the same room. You have to have a little bit of vulnerability to have growth and change. And, and I think that's what retrain allows people to do is really, you know, be vulnerable in spaces so we can attack and really work on the things to improve um, and live the life they want to live. Well, and especially if you're in such a public facing and authoritative yeah. position, having yeah. that safe space to kind of take care of yourself with out the need or the prying eyes of the community that you're supposed to be serving can be super, yeah. super helpful and give people that space to really yeah. grow and make change. Absolutely. It's true. And, and a lot of times what I find is when you are in that, that space of authority or especially in healthcare, a lot of times the support you seek, you work in those spaces. Maybe your insurance and your, you get your care uh, at, at the hospital you work at. And, and sometimes healthcare professionals don't want people. Uh, we know we have HIPAA, but the reality is you may see people you know and you don't want to share that. And unfor that's unfortunate because they may not be getting the care that they need. And, and those people as well um, need help. We're humans and, and deserve the time and rest and space. And, and, and fortunately right now in some positions, that's just not an option taking off a month to reset is just not an option for a lot of people. And there needs to be that bridge there. So absolutely, that's part of what, what I do with Retrain. So Krista Caramillo, if people are looking for more information about Retrain, if they'd like to reach out to you and participate, how could they do so? You can find me on LinkedIn at Krista Camarillo. You can find me on Instagram at Krista Camarillo Official, and that will take you into landing pages to schedule a discovery call with me. Awesome. Krista Camarillo of Retrain, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be right back after a short break. Thanks for sharing space with me. Thanks.
Welcome back to the show. The life of a comedian can definitely be a challenging one, just starting out especially. And today, with open mics being a little bit less of a thing and social media being a much bigger deal, Gretchen Pleshaw had the opportunity to speak to Dan Donahue about what it takes to make it as a comedian on social media. Let's take a look. Welcome back to the show. I am very stoked, very excited about this next human being I get to interview, Dan Donahue, LA-based comedian, and I am literally obsessed with all things of his. I follow him on Instagram. Dan, we are so amped that you're here this early with us. Well, via Zoom, thank you for coming in. Well, thank you for Zooming in. <laughs> oh, man, I, I, I wish I could afford a better quality camera for this, but yeah, how's it great. going, everybody? Nice to see you. Um, Dan, I'm loving the hair. The hair between you and I, we have a moment. <laughs> yeah, it's good when when you have a haircut like this. It's good because people never ask you like math problems in public or anything like that. <laughs> they just assume the worst, and it's good. Um, I heard from one of my friends who is a, mu a musician that I interviewed the other day. He said, "Trucker, stop chic." I thought that was pretty rad. Yeah, like yeah it. that that's about it. Yeah, it's it's stolen valor definitely, but I do <laughs> like having a mullet, and they put the name over my mouth. That's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, nice to talk to Vale. It's been a dream of mine since I started comedy to uh, be on uh, Vale local news. So this is huge for me. I think that you're being um, a little bit funny with us. Has that really been a dream of yours? We're going to get you out to Vale because I need to tell you this. You have a big following in Colorado and you have a big following in Vale. Because on Instagram, I checked it out and I have a lot of friends following you that are obsessed with you as well. Oh, that no, listen, I, a part of the reason I came on this program is to plug I you know, I need a place to stay out there. If someone could put me up, if someone can uh, get me food, I would love to be on a ski lift at some point. Please, I, I would am, love to set that up. I'm an epic skier. I'm not going to lie. I'm, that's my favorite oh, that's thing cool. to do. Nice. So, Dan, I have to say one of the things I love best about you is when you're doing your dishes and your dry sense of humor. It's hilarious. How did that all start? How did you think, oh, I'm going to do my dishes and just talk and be funny? Yeah, I mean, I've I've always uh, I've always done I've done stand up for the last maybe like seven or eight years, and you know, be you have to be on TikTok uh, in reels now because I, uh, Sad truth. I I guess we all just decided that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, Our cameraman is hilarious. <laughs> we all just decided that at some point, so uh, I I just decided I wanted to do. Uh, something where even if the video isn't funny and everyone hated it, my dishes would be done at the end of it. So it's that's kind of where it came from. It's a win-win. So I love your sense of humor because obviously you have a very dry sense of humor. Um, where did this funniness come inside of you? Have you always been funny? Did you make people laugh all the time when you were young? Because I'm not funny. I think you have to. It's oh, no, I was, I was very unfunny when I was younger. Uh, according to uh, several commenters online, I'm still not funny. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I like, you know, I, I think just the basics, uh, you know, a life of torment and bullying. And then, you know, you, you develop somewhat of a sense of humor. You did not get tormented, did you? Oh, yeah. Why? Oh, oh, are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. Why? What could they make fun of you about? Oh, it's so much. Um, <laughs> oh, so I didn't much. even have the mullet back then, so imagine that. But yeah, okay. I, my two front teeth crossed. I had a, I had a lisp. I was generally unpleasant to be around. That there's just a number of. <laughs> I was generally unpleasant to be around. <laughs> oh, you, 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 okay. Listen, and I, all I'm saying is they had a point. That's <laughs> all I'm saying. <laughs> I feel like this um, This should go on your dating app. I feel like this is a great thing for you right now. We're going to help you out. Um, so yeah, who... Generally uncomfortable to be around is a great tag. Mullet, generally uncomfortable to be around and likes to do my dishes. I mean, but that's a win, go. I feel like, doing that's dishes. That's not. Most, a lot of women with what's out there, they would look at that and be like, all right, I'll give it's it a shot. It's good. It's good, man. <laughs> um, who is your favorite comedian? Or who is your favorite person that you've worked with? Either or. Those are two great questions. Um, uh, my favorite comedian is Cat Williams. Uh, I think Cat Williams is the uh, greatest stand-up to ever live, in my personal opinion. Um, my favorite stand-up that I have worked with, um, and by worked with, I mean was like the smaller act while they were headlining. 
I, I got to work with Norm Macdonald before oh, he passed nice. away, and that was that was really special to me. He's brilliant. He's a yeah. brilliant human being. Very, very yeah. cool. It was really cool to be on a show with him. Dan, what do you have coming up? Oh, that's a great question. Not today, question. but in life, in general. <laughs> yeah, nothing today. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> this is a big the... moment, and then you're done. Uh, no, I'm... Uh... I have uh, tour dates coming up, cool. uh, Des Moines, Iowa, Kansas City, uh, Dayton, Kentucky, and... Wait, wait, wait. Did you say Dayton? Yeah, you know... This I'm is, from and that's Dayton, a great Ohio. Question. I'm from Dayton. And, and Dayton, Ohio, <laughs> and that's great, but no. l- listen to me very closely. Dayton, Ohio is like a real place. Th- real. Those aren't where I perform. I perform in Dayton, Kentucky, which is technically kind of in Cincinnati. Oh, so th- the nasty. Are- I know all about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so these these are the places that I'm contractually obligated to perform stand up in. And I'm very excited for it. Oh, I love that. Can get that a little higher next time? Yeah. Put it right over. There we go. Even yeah, there I we go. like it. I love it. This well, is like I'm getting interviewed for like a crime thing. You know what totally. I mean? Where they like keep the guy's uh, identity What did secret. you do? Do you recognize this mustache, people? What did you do? <laughs> um, I think that you should come out to Vail. I think that would be a moment. I think that we're going to make that happen. And then we'll if have you on the side. there are any multimillionaires, billionaires who want a, a private show in Vail and you will give me literally $500, I'm there. <laughs> 500 Well, we have an amazing space now called Chasing Rabbits. And... Okay. I, yeah, I think I'm going to have to make the phone call in because we have comedians come all the time. I think you'd be great for know. it. Let's do Let it. <laughs> so, Dan, is there anything you want to leave us off with? Yes. Uh, the tour, the, the, all my stuff is on Instagram. And uh, listen to the solo works of Michael McDonald. Uh, if that's what it takes, his debut solo album's really great, and you should give it a listen. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can we have you back on? We love you here. I, anytime. Awesome. Anytime. <laughs> like yeah. tomorrow. Cool. I'll I would love up. that. <laughs> Every, four hours. I got nothing to do. You're washing your dishes, man. You have stuff to do. Yeah, a little, that five minutes and then I'm back. And then out. <laughs> Dan Donahue, thank you so much. You're so dope. We adore you, you here. All. We're going to see you soon here in Vail. I'm going to make Very, it work. I can't wait. I'm your manager now, Gretchen Pleshaw. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You're got better it. than mine. Oh, hey, I'll do it. I'll text you later. (laughs) Dan, thanks so much. Keep it right. This weather report is brought to you by Sun and Ski Sports, your new mountain sports headquarters. back to the show. As we're starting to move into the winter season, one of the things we always want to make sure that we take care of as part of our fall chores is going to the doctor. And Kimberly Perot had the opportunity to talk to an expert on the things you should ask your primary care physician on just a general appointment. A couple of tips to make sure that you get everything you need out of your standard doctor's visit. Let's take a look. Now we are in the month of October and it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but oftentimes adults don't even know where to start. Joining us today to talk about primary care physicians and how to really take charge of your health is Dr. Soraya Sicosio, the East Region Chief Medical Officer of Carillon Health. Dr. Soraya, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show today. So. I was reading and researching, and one in four adults don't have a primary care physician. So why is this so important to have a primary care doctor on a regular basis? Well, Kimberly, that's concerning to me as well as a family physician, because here's what the studies show. We know that people who have a primary care physician live longer and have more quality in their life. 
I know that's definitely important. It kind of takes out the guessing and the wondering where your health currently stands. And when you're younger, you're obviously getting checkups regularly, so you know exactly where you are if you are in the right space. So people become nervous with their doctor. So what advice do you have for better visits? We do, and there are simple tips that you can follow to get more comfortable. For one, the number one is prepare. If you have questions, and certainly if you're on medications, write those down, bring them with you, and also bring someone with you, a family member or a friend, because it's a lot of information. Healthcare can be complicated. You wanna make sure you get the story straight. I, I love that advice. Be prepared by bringing your medication, bring someone with you. So that kind of leads into my next question. You know, oftentimes people forget the information that they've received from their doctor. So outside of that, tell us more how we can prepare in advance and really remember what we've been told and the advice we've been given. Along with that list that you bring, it's also so important to make sure you speak up, share what you're afraid of. Oftentimes people are afraid to go to the doctor because they're afraid of what they're, what they're going to hear. And we want to know, we're here to help. And that being said, write it down, not only as you prepare, but when you're in the exam room, it's okay to have a pen and a piece of paper to write that down. Or you can even put it in your phone if that's the best way that you can remember. And then finally, make sure you get a recap. Don't leave the office without having all of your questions answered. After all, it's your health. Oh, I'm an avid note taker in the notes section of my phone, so I think that's a really great tip. Now, do you have any advice to better foster a relationship with your primary care doctor? The first step is get a primary care doctor. And as you said, one in four people don't even have one, and this is really important. So make that call or dial up through your patient portal to get that appointment scheduled. Don't save your PCP visits for when you're sick. It's also to make sure that you're well. So get that first visit, have that checkup, make sure you ask your questions and get all of them answered. I think that's exactly right. And learning to be honest, and that's one way to have a really great relationship with your doctor. Now, where can we go for more information? Well, I recommend everyone go to the carillonhealth.com website. At carolinhealth.com, you can get a recap of this conversation, and we can answer so many of your other questions about your health, how to be healthy, how to be prepared, and live your best life. Thank you so much, Dr. Soraya. Now, do you have one personal tip that you want to share with our viewers? Where do we start outside of the website? Get that family doctor, get your primary care physician, and share your story. You'd be surprised once you open up to your doctor how healthy you can be by getting those questions answered. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Soraya. I wish I could call you to be my family care physician. You are wonderful. Thank you for all of the tips that you've shared. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you and be well. Now, stay tuned. We have a lot more here on Good Morning Vale on this second hour. It is very important to make sure that you have a family doctor or primary care physician. Speak up, prepare ahead of time, bring someone with you, take notes, ask for a recap. Your health is all that you have outside of everything else. So make sure that you sign up at Carolyn Health. We'll be right back after this. Thank you so much for tuning in to this Saturday edition of Wasatch Weekends. Don't forget to catch us tomorrow where we've got a children's book author and illustrator stopping by. And then we've also got a conversation with a doctor about a little bit of breast cancer awareness. Until then, I'm your host, Ben Roof, and this is Wasatch Weekends. I'll see you tomorrow.